which is a subcommittee for event data recorders on trucks and buses. Are you also a member of the National Association of Professional Reconstruction Specialists? I am. Does that require a certain level of education? Uh, it does, and it, it requires, as far as I know when I joined, uh, sort of proof that you are active within the field of accident reconstruction. That was my next question. Uh, it requires you to stay current on accident reconstruction issues, correct? Correct. Have you also authored peer-reviewed articles on, uh, in your, within your field and yes. subfield? Uh, is it fair to say that you've authored or co-authored a number of peer-reviewed papers in the field of accident reconstruction specifically, as well as EDR data retrieval? That's correct. Uh, have any of your peer-reviewed articles uh, that you've either authored or co-authored specifically focused on Toyota vehicles? Yes. Can you name one, please? Um, specifically, this year, published a paper where we um, studied the effects of collision-induced power loss on the way data is recorded in Toyota systems. And that would include Lexus systems. Fundamentally, they're the same components. It's just a different brand on top. In January 2025, did you co-author a publication entitled Simulation of Vehicle Speed Sensor Data for Use in Heavy Vehicle Event Data Recording Testing? Mr. Jackson, you're going to have to repeat that. Of course. Sorry. In January 2025, did you co-author a publication entitled Simulation of Vehicle Speed Sensor Data for Use in Heavy Vehicle Event Data Recorder Testing? Yes, I was the lead author on that paper. Uh, when you're dealing with retrieving data from a vehicle, an EDR, an event data recorder, uh, Toyota paper, whatever it might be, and that's a term of art, Toyota paper, correct? Sure. Um, does it matter if the vehicle is a heavy vehicle, a small vehicle, a passenger vehicle, a moped, or a skateboard if they happen to have an infotainment center on it? There are differences, of course, between the data that comes out of passenger vehicles and the data that comes out of heavy trucks, but there are also a lot of fundamental similarities to those. Like, for example, they all record vehicle speed. They all have accelerator pedals. They all have brake pedals. So a lot of the core data we're analyzing uh, is very similar. In January 2020, did you co-author a publication entitled Chip and Board Level Digital Forensics of Cummins Heavy Vehicle Data Event Recorders? Yes, I did. Okay. And what was the, the fundamental, without getting into the granular details, the fundamental aspect of that paper? So in that research, um, we introduced a new technique for getting data out of damaged uh, modules. So, you know, they're, they're either burned, um, they've been submerged in the water, they're crushed physically from impact. Uh, we demonstrated a new method to be able to get data less invasively, but still at the chip level. And we also demonstrated that we could translate that data from the chips outside of the software that was provided. So you can you could use the software and get the data that way. And we demonstrated we could basically do it ourselves if we wanted to. Mr. Sogra, have you been qualified in other courts to testify as an expert in the area of accident reconstruction, EDR data uh, retrieval? And yes. How many times? Once. When was that? Uh, in New York. You were deemed qualified as an expert in that court in this field that you're talking about today? Specifically with, uh, as it relates to data, yes. I want to talk a little bit about what you were asked to do in this case. Uh, we asked to undertake a review of certain work performed by a person by the name of Shannon Burgess with Aperture LLC. Yes. Are you familiar with Aperture? Yes. Before you were asked to undertake that review, uh, were you familiar with Aperture? Yes. Were you familiar specifically with Shannon Burgess? Yes. Were you asked to engage in any original analysis in this case? All of my analysis is fundamentally based on all of the data and the numbers provided in the Aperture reports. So uh, more or less the answer to your question is no. So you were asked specifically to give the court and the jurors clarity on data that Shannon Burgess had analyzed and provided a report about, correct? Correct. And that dealt with data obtained from Ms. Reed's SUV, Karen Reed's SUV, correct? Correct. Did you, in fact, review Shannon Burgess's report summarizing his findings and conclusions uh, regarding clock drift 
that report was dated in January of 2025. Yes. And what did you do in that regard? Uh, I analyzed the methods that Mr. Burgess proposed for aligning the clocks in that report. Were you also asked at some point to review Judson Welcher's report and PowerPoint uh, presentation regarding the timing of the tech stream event known as 1162-2, 1162-2? Yes. Did you determine whether Dr. Welcher had based his report on Shannon Burgess's analysis? Yes. Before we get into that, I want to ask you a couple of questions about tech stream events. So we, we're all talking sort of with the same vocabulary, if we could. When I say tre uh, tech stream event, have you ever heard that called a trigger event? Yes. Are those sort of synonymous? The, the event, in order to be generated, has to be triggered by something. So, yes. You became aware in your analysis, I'm assuming that Dr. Welcher reported a trigger event at a particular time or span of time, correct? Correct. What span of time was that? I, what, I should say, what time was that? For which event? For the 1162-2 event, sorry. Do you mind if I reference the slide because I don't have the number committed? With the court's so permission. Go ahead. Do you have a copy of it in front of you? I do, Your Honor. The original analysis places event 1162-2 ending at 12.31.43 a.m. Now, Dr. Welcher, this is what I want to talk about for just a quick second. Dr. Welcher indicated that the trigger event began at 12.31.38, correct? I believe so. That would suggest yeah. that a trigger event lasts five seconds, 12.31.38 to 12.31.43, correct? Objection. Sustained is to four. Let me ask you this. Does a trigger event or does a tech stream event last five seconds or 10 seconds? The trigger is a singular point in time. That's my question. All right, so if we're thinking about a trigger event, it's like that clap, snap, right? It's a point in time, not a series of, not a, not a time span, correct? It's a singular point, correct. Okay. Does a trigger event or a tech stream event cause a recording to bookend the trigger event itself? Yes. Explain that for the jurors so that we're very clear about that. Sure. So when an event is triggered, what we end up with is some data from before the event was triggered and some data from after the event was triggered. The way it does that is it's kind of always recording. And as soon as it sees a trigger, it says, aha, and it goes and it grabs the previous five seconds. That number can vary. It can be more or less than five. But uh, for the specific trigger we're talking about, it grabs the previous five seconds of data. And then it keeps recording for an additional five seconds. And that completes its recording phase. Right. So if Dr. Welcher indicated that the text stream event, the trigger, was at 1231.38, would it be accurate if he said that trigger ended at 1231.43? Objection. Sustained is to four. Is there any, if a trigger event is one point in time, one, one snap in time, would it be accurate to say that the trigger event itself lasted five seconds and ended five seconds later? It wouldn't be accurate to say the trigger lasted that's, that that's long. That's my question. The event lasts that long, but the trigger is only one point within the event. The recording lasts that long. Right. Correct? Correct. So in other words, it captures, or does it, let me ask you this, does it capture five seconds before and five seconds after, but the trigger event is the singular point right in the middle? That's correct. Okay.
if we were to calculate the window between the trigger event or the tech stream event and a lock event on John O'Keefe's phone, you analyzed both, correct? Or you, you reviewed both, correct? Correct. Would you calculate from the point of the trigger, would you calculate from 12, 31, 38, that point in time, and I'm using the tip of my pen to represent the point, at 12, 31, 38, or would you calculate it from 12, 31, 43? Customarily, when we're doing any analysis, we're referencing everything off of the trigger. Um, that's the normal way. Everything in the aperture reports uh, was referenced off of the end of the event. So of the it, recording event. Of the recording event. Not so, the trigger. Correct. And I didn't correct that. I just went with that convention for all of the uh, analysis I did. But you noted it, correct? Correct. And you noted that that would be five seconds inaccurate? I'll, I'll withdraw it. I'll ask it a different way. What would be the effect of timing if you were to start at the trigger event, 12.31.38, versus timing the event if you were to start at 12.31.43? There'd be approximately five second difference in every subsequent calculation. And if, in fact, there was a lock event, which you reviewed, at 12.32.09, how long would the actual window be from the trigger event to 1231, sorry, 1232.09. It would be larger, by five seconds, approximately. So it would actually be 31 seconds, correct? Did I do my math right? You did. Welcome back. Today we're diving into the testimony of defense witness Matthew DeSogra, a qualified accident reconstructionist and walking encyclopedia of event data recorders. The prosecution probably wishes he'd taken a wrong turn on the way to the courtroom, because what we witnessed during his testimony wasn't just the lesson in data analysis. It was a systematic dismantling of the prosecution's magical mystery timeline. DeSogra walks in with credentials that, frankly, the state's experts should be embarrassed to sit next to. Member of the National Association of Professional Reconstruction Specialists? Check authored peer-reviewed papers on both general accident reconstruction and Toyota-specific systems? Double-check. Lead author on a 2025 publication about vehicle speed sensor data for heavy trucks? Yeah, this guy isn't Googling how to read a car's black box the night before trial. And before the prosecution can even try to discredit him, we learn he's already been qualified in another court as an expert. Not just someone who dabbles in car crash science, an actual expert, the kind who's taught the course, published the textbook, and probably invented the software. So what exactly was DeSogra asked to do? Let's clear that up. The defense didn't bring him in to spin wild theories. They asked him to review the work of another analyst, Shannon Burgess from Aperture LLC. Burgess is the prosecution's go-to guy on EDR data. But apparently, his conclusions needed a little translation, and clarity, and basic math. DeSogra didn't do his own deep-dive investigation here. He reviewed the same data, the same reports, and pointed out that the conclusions being drawn, especially by one Dr. Judson Welcher, were based on some very questionable timing conventions. Let's be honest, if you're building a house and you start five feet off the foundation, the entire structure is going to collapse. That's basically what happened with Burgess and Welcher. They didn't use the actual trigger point in their timing calculations. They used the end of the recording window. That's not just imprecise, it's misleading. And DeSogra calls it out. Here's where things get spicy. The defense gets DeSogra to explain what a tech stream event is. Not in a confusing, jargon-laden way, but with a simple analogy like a snap of your fingers. It's one moment in time that causes a vehicle system to log data before and after that moment. Five seconds before. Five seconds after. That's it. But here's the kicker. The prosecution's experts, instead of using the snap, the actual trigger, they use the last point in the 10-second data log. 
It's like marking your birthday party as starting when the cake is served instead of when the guests arrive. And this isn't a minor detail. It creates a five-second discrepancy that alters every subsequent calculation. And guess what? Objection. The prosecution doesn't want the jury to hear the obvious, that their own experts are measuring time like they're using a sundial on a cloudy day. Desogra keeps his cool while explaining that using the wrong start time results in a five-second error every time. So when you're analyzing whether Karen Reed's SUV could have possibly hit John O'Keefe based on data seconds matter. Five seconds isn't a rounding error. It's a wrecking ball through the prosecution's theory. And when DeSogra walks the jury through the comparison between the trigger event at 12 hours, 31 minutes and 38 seconds and the lock event on O'Keefe's phone at 12 hours, 32 minutes and 9 seconds, the math speaks for itself. If you calculate from the correct trigger point, the window is 31 seconds. But the prosecution wants the jury to believe it's only 26 seconds. That five-second fudge isn't innocent. It's essential for making their timeline look viable. And DeSogra? He didn't correct it in his own analysis because he followed the same flawed convention to keep the comparison fair. But he noted the issue. That's the difference between scientific integrity and prosecutorial wishful thinking. What becomes increasingly clear throughout this testimony is that the prosecution's own experts either fundamentally misunderstand how EDRs work or they're hoping the jury does. Because if they knew how triggers, event windows, and clock drift actually functioned, they wouldn't have made such basic, glaring errors. DeSogra's calm, matter-of-fact dismantling of their entire methodology is almost painful to watch. He doesn't need theatrics. The truth is dramatic enough. His analogies like always recording systems that grab the previous and subsequent seconds once a trigger is detected paint a picture the jury can actually understand. That's probably why the state keeps objecting. They don't want the jury following along. And speaking of objections, every time the defense tries to point out the absurdity of calling a trigger event a five-second span, the state jumps up like they've been burned. Why? Because when you build your case on flawed timestamps, the last thing you want is a defense expert explaining what time it really is. One of the most telling parts of DeSogra's testimony, the moment where he points out that Welcher, the prosecution's shiny expert, didn't even base his own conclusions on original analysis. No, he used Burgess's already flawed report as a springboard. So we've got a house of cards built on someone else's miscalculated foundation. DeSogra highlights this gently, but the implication is crushing. If Burgess is wrong, and the evidence says he is, then Welcher's entire presentation is trash built on trash. That's not science. That's storytelling. And not good storytelling either. More like one of those late-night reruns where the killer's alibi falls apart the moment someone checks the security footage. Only in this case, the footage is data, and DeSogra is the guy pointing out that the timestamp is five seconds off. So what does all this mean for Karen Reed? It means the prosecution's forensic fantasy falls apart under real scrutiny. It means that when you bring in someone who actually knows how EDR data works and how to properly analyze trigger events, the entire state timeline crumbles. It means that for all their PowerPoints and charts, they couldn't even start counting at the right point on the clock. And that matters. Because if their timeline is wrong, their theory is wrong. If their experts can't define a trigger, they can't define a crime. Matthew DeSogra didn't come in to dazzle. He came in to clarify. And sometimes the most devastating blow isn't a flashy accusation. It's the simple truth, explained by someone who knows exactly what he's talking about. That's all for now. If you're keeping track, that's another defense witness who completely shredded the prosecution's timeline, this time with science, math, and actual credentials. Next time the state wants to sell a timeline, they better get someone who knows how clocks work. Until then, stay sharp, question everything, and don't let five seconds of bad math send someone to prison. See you in the next video.